if you do establish a healthy boundary practice in that communication and you get better at both setting and receiving other people's boundaries, there's only freedom and improved relationships and better mental health and less anxiety and you know less stress and discomfort to be had from that practice. Melissa, for somebody who is evaluating their life right now saying, you know, things are pretty good, I feel good, but you know, there's some people in my life that seem to be overstepping and and even with myself, there's times when I'm not keeping true to my word. How do we begin to know when boundaries are needed and and what kind of assessment can we do to kind of set the scene right at the beginning to do this work? Yeah, so There's sort of two categories of boundaries, and I think the ones we think about the most are setting boundaries with other people, and that's those are certainly incredibly important. Some signs that you may need to set a boundary with someone includes dread or apprehension when you think about engaging with them. Maybe you see their name come up on your text message and you just turn it off, or they're constantly inviting you places and you are always looking for reasons to decline. When you leave engagements with them, you feel energetically drained, like all of your energy has just been zapped and you feel exhausted. Or if you feel like you can't really be your full self around them, like you can't show up as your full best self, maybe it's that every time you leave your interaction, you feel worse about yourself rather than better. Or you feel like they're constantly telling you either, overtly or covertly, that their needs are more important than yours. Those are definitely some signs that a boundary is needed. You may need to identify areas in which self-boundaries, boundaries with yourself would be helpful too. If there are certain parts of your day that are incredibly stressful and you just dread you know, these certain situations coming up, or if there are certain areas of technology or areas of engagement in your own home where you feel like your energy is getting zapped. All of these are signs or signals that there's some aspect of your life or your relationship with others or yourself that a boundary is needed. Okay. Well, let's start with, you mentioned the two categories there. Let's start with other people. Mm -hmm. And just to start out really broadly, what are some of the biggest categories when it comes to boundaries that we need to look at when it comes to the other people in our lives? So a lot of boundary experts will categorize boundaries into sort of areas of your life in which the boundary supports, like financial or emotional or physical. And I always found those a little bit challenging to navigate because there are so many boundary scenarios that support multiple areas of your life. So the way I categorize them is based on your relationship. So I have relationship categories. You may want to set a boundary with a romantic partner. You may want to set a boundary with somebody at work, so a colleague or a boss or a client. You may want to set boundaries with friends or neighbors. I have another chapter in the book that's all about family members, specifically parents and in-laws, grandparents, and other family members. Maybe you need to set a boundary around your relationship with yourself when it comes to the food you're eating or alcohol that you're drinking or diet talk or table talk or weight loss talk. Sometimes you need to set a boundary with strangers too around sensitive subjects. So grief, various life stages, illness, injury. Those are the ways that I choose to categorize boundaries. And for somebody who is ready to dive in and do this work and really assess where they're at when it comes to boundaries in their life, do you recommend taking a certain period of time and and writing down all the areas that they you know might want to go further into? And then once they have that, how do they begin to prioritize? Because it can be overwhelming if this is new work and there's different, so many different areas that they need to do the work in. How do they go about deciding where to start? So I think if you sat down and you tried to identify every boundary overstep in your life, it would quickly become overwhelming and you would feel disempowered. Like, gosh, this is so, I've been putting up with so much for so long. I don't know where to start. I have a worksheet that accompanies the book that people can print off and fill out that just asks you to look at one boundary at a time. So it starts off by asking you to identify one particular situation that is stressful or energy depleting or that's been bothering you and identify what the behavior is, what the relationship is, and how you might feel if you're able to successfully set a boundary. And I think that you can start in one of two places. You can either go with some low-hanging fruit 
to help you build your confidence, practice your words, see what it feels like to actually stick up for yourself and have that be respected. Or you can tackle the big one first, the one that is the most energy depleting, the most distracting in your own life, the most harmful, and see if one boundary request or setting or holding one boundary can take away like 60% of your stress in this one area. And either approach I think is equally like worthy and valid. It just depends on how the person wants to dive in. And I can imagine if you're you're setting a boundary with say a romantic partner or a boss and you have a number of different areas with that specific person you need to address, you'd want to, you know, prioritize and not come at them with, you know, five new things because you just learned from Melissa, you know, how to set boundaries and you're excited and you just want to get everything in order. Talk about a strategy of, you know, doing this over time in a more sustainable way. Absolutely. So, you know, if you're talking about setting boundaries at work, there are some specific challenges at play, particularly the power dynamics involved in work, especially if you're trying to set a boundary with someone who is senior in the organization, who has more tenure or experience, or frankly, if you're just trying to set a boundary with someone that your boss likes better, you have to think about that. There's also a challenge involved in that holding the boundary may not be an action that is reasonable or even possible for you to take, like transferring or quitting your job. So there are certainly challenges there, but one of the areas that you can start with is setting a boundary around an area that is supported by your HR manual or company procedures. Start with something as simple as taking time off, whether it's your nights or your weekends or a vacation or a sick day, and setting and holding boundaries around you preserving that time for yourself and not being on call, not responding to work emails and texts. That's one way to set a boundary to know that your personal time is being protected, to start the process of saying like, hey, I'm going to stick up for myself in this situation and to have the safety and security of company policy backing you up. That's like a, a really good entry point in that situation. I'm excited to share with you my favorite magnesium supplement, Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. Click the link in the description to save 10%. And now back to the show. Well, let's take that example and go into the nitty gritty. So I really like your breakdown in the book, how you have different levels, green, yellow, and red. Let's let's take this from ground zero, and this is a new boundary you're implementing with your boss, and we'll use the example of related to, say, at 6 p.m. every night, you, you want communication with the boss to end at that point. So let's talk about, this is still in the healthy realm, this is you bringing it to the boss's attention for the first time. Let's go over some scripts of what that could look like to do that in a healthy way, starting from green and then moving up to red. Yes. So I do have a three-tiered approach to my boundary scripts. And my approach is essentially minimum effort, maximum effect. I want to use the gentlest, kindest language possible and still have my boundary be respected. And this green, yellow, red responds to or is, is in response to the level of threat that this behavior currently poses. So The first time you leave the office at 6 and your boss sends you a text on your personal phone at 6.30 to ask you to remember to do something or did you check on that report, it's the first time it happened. You can go in assuming that the boss like simply forgot or didn't realize how late it was, your time of day. This is really important if you all work remotely and people are in different time zones. So your boundary language here can be gentle. It can be kind. It can assume of the best. So in this first instance, I would probably set a green boundary by sending a response back. Hey, boss, um, it's 630 and this is my family time, but I did look at that report and I'll talk to you in the morning. Going forward, please send messages after hours via email so it doesn't bother my family time and I can respond to them, you know, first thing during business hours. That's like the first response I would send. I answer the question, but I also set the boundary clearly and kindly. If it happens again... Like the next night or a week later, your boss is still texting you after hours. I would not respond to the question asked. I would simply say, hey, boss, it's 630. This is my family time. I'll connect with you tomorrow. Going forward, please don't text me after hours. Still polite, still clear, still kind, but I'm using stronger language now because this has happened before. If it continues to happen, you are in a very toxic work environment now, and I would go in and set a red level boundary. I would not reply to the text at all. I would go into the office and probably also in writing document, I continue to ask you not to contact me after hours. 
If you have something you want to sit, share, please send it via email and I'll respond to it on the next business day. Our company policies say that this time should be protected for family and I'm asking you to respect that. So that's an example of how you might escalate the language in that particular situation. That makes a lot of sense. Great detail there. What I'm curious about, I'm sure a lot of people who this is new to them, they're wondering how much language is too much. And we can, again, take that from the beginning where somebody doesn't want to be contacted after 6 p.m. by the boss. Is it enough just to tell them that straight up, boss, after 6 p.m., I'd like you to please not contact me anymore and not give a reason? In short, yes. In short, people do not have to understand or agree with your boundary in order to respect it. And over explaining your boundary often makes it sound weaker. And as women, especially, we have been conditioned such that we'd better have a darn good reason for having a need and expressing that need and asking you to meet that need. And I really want to emphasize with this book that like that is not the case. You are worthy of having needs and you're worthy of asking for respect for those needs. Now, in the spirit of good communication, I might say something like 630 is my family time right? That's one very brief way of kind of explaining like, look, we're off the clock, we're after hours. But it is also perfectly acceptable and still polite to say, hey boss, after 6 p.m. I'm off the clock. Please don't text my personal phone. Absolutely perfectly justified to say. And again, sometimes over explaining can weaken your cause. If you say, I've got a family thing tonight and I'm having dinner and I just don't want to. What happens if the next time your boss texts, you don't have a family thing? You're not doing anything. Then it's almost like you feel like you have to justify or make up a reason for why you don't want to be texted when the reason is after 6 p.m. I'm off the clock and I will not respond to work-related communications. Okay, let's give an example here where you give a clear boundary where 6.30, you contacted me, this is my family time, this isn't right. And then you have a boss who starts to pry and say, why? And, And, you know, really digs in and they're not just letting it go. Yeah. So I have a little section in the book about navigating the whys. Sometimes you might choose to respond. If you're setting a boundary with somebody and you're you're attempting to preserve the relationship or you have a good relationship and the boundary is something like, please don't comment on my body or my body weight. And this is a new request. They might say, if they acknowledge it first, yes, understood, I will not. Can you tell me more about it? That's a situation in which you may want to have the conversation, right? You're sharing more deeply, more vulnerably. They've already shared that they're going to respect the boundary. That's a scenario in which I might volunteer more information in the spirit of connection. If they say, why? I'm just asking you about your weight or why? I just have a quick question. That's a little bit different. They are not demonstrating respect for your boundary. They're asking you to justify it. And maybe if they agree with it, they'll respect it. And that is not how the invitation works. So if you have a boss who continues to pry, you might say in that instance, let's talk about this tomorrow when I'm in the office. And then you cease all communications. A boundary is not about telling other people what to do. You can't keep your boss from sending you text after text after text. What you can do is refuse to respond. That is the boundary that you can hold. And then the next day you go into the office and maybe you loop in their boss or HR and you say, when I am off the clock, I will not be responding to work-related communications unless it's a you know a clear emergency. This was not an emergency. I've asked you not to contact me on my personal phone after hours. Here are three ways that you could share your thoughts with me because I'm not trying to hamstring when you have good ideas and want to get them out in ways that do not disturb my family time. You can send a Slack message and I have Slack communications notifications turned off. You can schedule an email to be sent early the next morning so you can get it down and not worry about interrupting my family time. Or you can make a note to yourself and bring it up with me first thing in the morning, right? So we're communicating here, but we're also making it clear that my boundary is that I will not be responding to work-related communications when I am off the clock. And that is a perfectly reasonable request. I don't want to derail us too much off the work topic because I want to get into this a little bit more. But just to reinforce something you talked about there, the boundary being about you and not the other person. I'll give a different example that you use in the book that I think will really hammer this home. And it's if somebody comes over to to your house and say they're a smoker. And for, for you as the boundary setter, it's not about convincing them not to smoke. 
It's just saying in my house, this is my rule, you need to go outside to smoke. Exactly. I think there's a common misconception or misperception about boundaries that they are controlling, that boundaries are about telling other people what to do. And a boundary cannot tell someone else what to do. That is not my business. I cannot control that. Instead, a boundary tells other people what what I am going to do to keep myself safe and healthy. So the example you just shared is perfect. If you come into my house and you pull out a cigarette, I'm not going to say you shouldn't smoke. Not my business. That's not a boundary. I'm not going to say don't smoke in your house or your car or my neighbor's house. That's not my boundary to set. What I am going to say is I don't allow smoking in my house because it makes me cough and it smells bad. And I invite them to either go outside or put the cigarette away. Now, I can't make them, but in the spirit of good communication, I am letting them know that I have a limit. Maybe they didn't know. They're not a mind reader. I'm expressing that limit clearly and kindly, and I'm inviting them to meet me in that limit as a way of improving our relationship. They can either choose to or not. And if they don't, if they do light up, then my language becomes stronger, or perhaps I enact The final boundary, which is I simply don't allow this person over anymore and don't invite them, right? So that's how a boundary escalates and how it comes from the self always. Coming back to the work piece, I can see how there's this extra layer and we'll get into other examples where this layer exists as well, where if you're working for somebody, that's your paycheck that pays for, you know, your, your car lease and your, your mortgage payment, your food. So I can see how somebody in that situation might be a little bit more timid, especially if they're new to setting boundaries where, you know, there is something to lose by creating friction between you and the boss. Yes. And, you know, I know that there are folks who would say, well, if you're in that toxic a work environment where your boss is just not respecting your personal time, just quit. And that is obviously intensely privileged. And so many people, most people, I would say, are like not in that position to be able to do so. But you need to think about it from the perspective of like a fair exchange of labor for value, for payment. In certain situations, there are probably expectations where in busy seasons, during a project, in a moment of crisis, yeah, I might have to respond to some after-hour texts. I might have to work on a weekend. Certainly, my team experiences that once in a while. But in the context of a healthy workplace culture where those seasons are brief, the extra efforts are acknowledged and appreciated either monetarily or with other benefits or with gratitude or with all three. And other boundaries are clearly communicated and respected, that feels very different to me. I am absolutely willing to answer my boss's text message if all of those other conditions are met and this is a specific situation. If you have a workplace culture in which none of those are happening, right? People just expect you to pitch in, come in on your day off, answer texts after hours, clock in, you know, do the work without clocking in. If your personal time isn't being respected, if your work time isn't being respected, if your ethics or values aren't being respected, that's a very different scenario. And you may find that you're waging an uphill battle trying to set boundaries in that context. And that's where I offer certain tips in the book, like try to find allies in the workplace, people who are setting boundaries or who are taking their sick time and actually not coming in. Rely on HR and your workplace policies. Talk to your coworkers because if you're feeling like this, maybe they are too and there's power in numbers and document everything just to protect yourself in case you do have to make a case for making a transfer or ultimately if you decide to leave your job. You mentioned seasonality there and it got me thinking about as somebody, again, we'll keep on this workforce thing here for a bit, somebody who's working for a boss and maybe they have a death in the family So they have a temporary situation where they need to set a boundary because maybe, you know, they're feeling low and and their energy is depleted. And and there's a certain period of time where they need these certain expectations to be met. How would you go about enforcing something like that? That's certainly a challenging situation because obviously that person's energetic capacity and mental health is solely in their court just because they've had a week or the boss thinks they've had enough time to come back to work certainly doesn't mean that they're energetically ready. This is where having a really good open line of communication with your boss and your coworkers is incredibly helpful. 
This is where, you know, having an ally in HR and making sure that workplace policies are clearly documented on things like bereavement time or leave time. This is where open communication saying, you know, here is what my capacity is. Are you willing to work with me? I can't be in the office eight hours this week, but I think I can handle some work from home. And if you allow me to do that on my schedule, I can show up. Some of these aren't necessarily boundary situations. Some of them are simply communication and expectation setting situations. And all of those really play in together to establishing a healthy workplace culture. And tying into this temporary boundary for specific needs at specific times gets me thinking about what if somebody has a boundary that they've set and set successfully and they have the people in the workforce obeying that boundary and and respecting them, but then something changes and they need to modify that boundary. Yes. I could see how that would cause a lot of confusion with other people in their life and and maybe even for themselves. They feel like, you know, what's happening here? I, I felt like this is what I needed and now now things are changing. Yes, that's such an excellent point. You know, the best boundaries are flexible and not rigid. And so I want to go into these conversations with setting the expectation with myself that in this moment, I have identified a limit that I need to keep myself safe and healthy. But if my context changes, if my capacity changes, if my life factors change, if outside factors change, like the season I'm in at work, or if my coworkers that I'm engaging with, if their behavior changes, I should, it is a healthy practice to continually go back and say, is this the, is this the limit I still need? Can I be more flexible? Do I not need it at all anymore? Because I was in a very difficult mental health situation then, and and now I'm not. And now I don't need the same boundary. So while it may be potentially confusing to others, I think a very simple explanation is just, this was what I needed then, and my context has changed, and I no longer need that anymore. So here is my communication of like where I am currently and how you and I can continue to maintain a close relationship together. That might include relaxing the boundary. That might include getting rid of it altogether. That might include strengthening it when you realize the boundary you've set is too timid or not quite strong enough. But I think you should go into it assuming that because things are changing all the time, your boundaries should be flexible with those changes as well. And for somebody who is going to soften a boundary or let a boundary go that served them before and isn't anymore, do you recommend, and you you talked about it there, but is it always the case where you want to vocalize that to the team? Or does it make sense sometimes just to kind of let that slide? And when people start pushing against what it used to be, just letting, letting things go? It kind of depends on the circumstance. One of the first boundaries I ever set with my friend group 22 years ago when I was new to recovery from my drug addiction is... You can never offer me drugs, ever. I don't want to see them. I don't want to see you doing them. I don't, even if I ask you for them, you can, like, this is what I need in order to maintain our relationship. Now, two years later, three years later, I no longer needed that, but I didn't go out of my way to say, hey, it's okay if you offer me drugs now. I'm feeling better. Like, I just, I just let that go because it didn't change our relationship at all and there was really no need to communicate it. If I've communicated to my boss, please don't text me after hours. This is my family time. And all of a sudden, my evenings become more flexible and I know we're in the middle of a really busy season. I might proactively say to my boss, hey, I know that we have this project going on. I know everyone's kind of putting in a little extra time and energy. So for the next three weeks until this thing is due... If you need me in the evening, I will do my best to make myself available. That feels like something that you would want to communicate in the spirit of good faith. So I think it depends on the context. Yeah. Essentially, what I'm hearing you say there is be, you know, a genuine human being, be open yeah. and, and express when needed and be compassionate and be a team player. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. Be a team player. But that doesn't necessarily mean the team's needs always trump your own. Be a team player in a sense of, I am willing to contribute what I have the capacity to contribute. And within that capacity, I will be generous. But I'm not going to overextend myself just to make someone else happy, just to make someone else comfortable. So that's kind of the 
I think the definition of team player these days in the workforce is you're going to do whatever we ask you to do because we ask you to do it and that's what's required. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to take a hard pass on that and say, I'm going to do as much as I can within my energetic capacity and be generous there while still prioritizing my own needs. Yeah. Really important clarification. So Mm -hmm. being a team player, but still respecting all your boundaries. Yeah. So Melissa, we've talked a lot about boundaries in the workplace from the perspective of us and other people we're working with, but you're somebody who's worked at home now for 12 years. You're somebody that has to manage everything yourself. I mean, I think you work with a team, but you're you're at the top of that hierarchy and, and you're somebody who's over time learned how to have boundaries when it comes to yourself and working from home. So I'd love for you to talk about the evolution there and what you've learned along the way. Yeah, I quit my full-time nine-to-five job in 2010 to take Whole30 full-time. And that was sort of the first time I ever, that was my first entrepreneuring journey. That was the first time I ever worked for myself. And when I tell you I had no boundaries, um, if an email came in at 10 p.m., I answered it. If a workshop request came in on a Sunday when I was hiking, I'd stop what I was doing and respond to the request. If a community member wanted me to write an article, I dropped everything and wrote it right then and there. I was glued to my laptop from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed, and I felt like I was at everybody's beck and call, and I ran myself absolutely ragged to the point where I experienced pretty major burnout really early on in my career, which was ironic because I was offering people health advice. And I quickly realized that people are you know, people will take as much as you are willing to give. And that's not a negative. That's just kind of the nature of human beings. And I was going to have to be the one to set some limits for myself if I was going to make this entrepreneuring journey sustainable. And all of the things I implemented then are sort of very effective now for anybody who's trying to work from home or start an entrepreneuring journey or, or just make their work time and their personal time count more. But One of the boundaries I set with myself, an important one, was that I do not check my phone or my computer before I finish my morning routine. And sometimes my morning routine is 15 minutes because I'm, you know, I've got to get the kid off to school and et cetera. Sometimes it's a solid hour or hour and a half, but I don't look at email. I don't look at Slack. I don't look at Instagram before that routine is done. That makes me start the day feeling proactive instead of reactive. I don't schedule calls or meetings as a rule before 10 a.m. so that I can start the workday, handle some email, and again, feel like I'm hitting the ground running instead of like sliding into my chair for this interview first thing, feeling very harried. I don't look at my phone in the hour before bed. We all know why you should not look at email in the hour before bed, and I don't do that. I eat lunch away from my desk, even if it's just 10 minutes to go upstairs. I have a dedicated workspace so that when I leave for the day, I can physically transition into the rest of my home and I don't have to look at papers and laptops scheduled, you know, kind of scattered over the dining room table or kitchen table. So these are all boundaries that I've set with myself that help me protect my time and energy and capacity around my own work environment. And I think it's important to highlight too, the fact that it has been 12 years and this is where you've evolved to, but for a lot of people who are just starting out as an entrepreneur and maybe they have a daytime job and they're doing this after work, maybe when the kids go to bed, I think there is a time and a place to push the boundaries and life has ebbs and flows when it comes to our output. I'm not sure if you agree with that or not, but you know, when you've been able to get to where you are today, we won't be able to go back and figure that out, but You probably have a pretty good idea, you know, because grinding is essential at certain times. Yes. So I reject the hustle culture 24-7. This like, when you're sleeping, I'm working and I'll sleep when I'm dead and 20, you know, on the grind 24-7. Like, nope, I reject that. I pay myself first. I practice self-care. I prioritize sleep. I take time off as I need it. However, because I have a good big picture holistic view of my efforts, I also build enough margin and capacity so that during periods of hustle, for example, when I'm on a book deadline, I am working 10 to 12 hours a day. I am getting up extra early. I am perhaps working you know, after my son goes to bed, which is not normal. That's a short-term project. I know that there's a beginning and an end. I know that I've taken good enough care of myself that this short-term effort is not going to burn me out for months and months on end. And I 
prioritize and triage within that short-term project. I've used this framework that Randy Zuckerberg created called Pick 3, where it's like at any given moment, you can only prioritize three areas of your life. Like you've got work, you've got sleep, you've got friends, you've got exercise. Oh, what's the fifth one? Um, But there's like these different areas and you can only do three of them at once. So for me, it's like, okay, it's, oh, family is the last one. So for me in periods of hustle, it's work, family, exercise, boom. That means if I'm short slept, okay. That means if I don't see my friends for a month or two, okay. I bring those back in holistically when I am able, but that doesn't continue long-term. I don't allow those habits to continue once that project is over. And I often allow myself like a decompression period after to let myself recover from some of the efforts of that stressor. And so that's how I'm able to incorporate periods of hustle without burning myself out. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So different periods, even where you're at in the journey now, but especially Mm -hmm. I think in the beginning when things are getting off the ground, it can take that extra effort to transition in life. Yes. You know, I think when people are starting out, I like to use the credit card analogy. When people are starting out, they feel like they need to go as hard and as fast and as long as they can. And what you are doing is maxing out your credit card. And then when you try to slow down, you're going to be making minimum payments and that interest is adding up and you will never have enough capacity to actually make progress on that credit card. But if you go just a little slower than you want to and you build in those periods in the beginning you're now in it for a long time and a good time. And that's highly you know, recommended when you are just starting an entrepreneuring journey. And I think for a lot of people, I know this is a case for me, where as you begin to get momentum as an entrepreneur and have success, the goalposts always get pushed further back. You know, you start achieving yeah. certain goals, but then however many subscribers or whatever revenue you're always you all your mind i think it's just human nature is always trying to set a bigger goal so if you're somebody that's burning the candle at both ends and and always trying to achieve bigger and bigger goals you get caught in this rat race and in this cycle yeah and are you really enjoying life well that's the thing isn't it you know if you are never allowing yourself the moment or time to celebrate your accomplishments to simply exist, like things that you've hit a goal, things are going great. Can you just sit in that for a month, two months, three months? You know, focus perhaps maybe not on setting a new goal for yourself, but deepening the accomplishments you already have. Can I create a deeper connection with my community? Can I listen more? Can I use this as a period of planning? You know, think about it like periodization when you're doing a creating a workout program. You're not just more, more, more progressive overload all the time. You have deload weeks and you have rest weeks and rest periods. And I think you should plan your entrepreneuring journey that same way so that you don't have burnout, so that you are not mindlessly setting goals. Like, okay, well, I just got a thousand subscribers, so 2000 is better. Is it? Is it? Or should you maybe create new offerings to work within those 1000 subscribers? Do a survey to ask what else they might want to see. Like more isn't necessarily better. Better is better. And if we're not allowing us to take a pause and reflect on what we've done, where we've been, and where we want to go, We might just blindly be chasing that carrot that's leading us off into a direction that doesn't serve our business or the journey. And I think a helpful tool for somebody that needs to create more balance or boundaries in their life, and and they're maybe in a period right now where they aren't thinking big picture and they're pushing, 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 is to zoom back and realize how finite life is. And that could be a catalyst for change for people that need that because I think we're probably around the same age. And and when you get to a certain age, you know, you start thinking more about the fact that life doesn't go on forever. These are my priorities. And I just think that could be a helpful tool for somebody who needs that little bit of a nudge into setting boundaries or creating more balance in their life. It is. And it's really hard to do. It's really hard to voluntarily take that step back because you're in it. You are so deeply in it every single day that you have to very conscientiously stop and pull back. Unfortunately, the reason many of us do stop and pull back and look at the bigger picture is because we encounter a crisis. We have a death in the family or there's a health challenge or a a divorce or something 
really terrible happens that forces us to stop and take a look back and reflect. If you can build that in ahead of time, I think it's incredibly valuable. I remember a few years ago, I was talking to this investor group about maybe coming in and investing in Whole30 and we were talking about it and talking about their plans. And I sat back and I thought, you know, it was very intriguing, obviously, the money and the glamour. And it was very appealing. But I sat back and I thought, you know, my son is six. As he gets older, do I want to work more? Do I want to go back to working 80 hours a week to make an investor happy? Do I want to have these like stretch goals that mean that my entire team and me especially has to like go back and really start hustling again? No, I don't. I want to work less as he gets older. I want to have more time with him. I want to play more with him. I want to travel more. And that was able to really help me successfully inform my decision to go, no, this isn't the path I want to take. So if you can do that on your own, kudos to you. I think it's incredibly helpful. And it'd be great if you didn't have to wait until crisis came to take that step. Well, tying into what we're talking about here is setting your big goal and knowing where you're going. So you don't get caught up in what I talked about mm. before. The fact that, okay, I have a thousand more subscribers. Oh, wouldn't a thousand more be nice? Yeah. Or I've made this amount of money and my family's comfortable, but wouldn't doubling that give me you know, more fun vacations or whatever it would be, a nicer car or things that don't really matter? So having that big goal and realizing what it is you're going for in life to make you happy, and then I think that can make you more satisfied as you progress at least as an entrepreneur. Yeah. It's hard. Different people are motivated by different things. I'm not a profit-motivated CEO. Doesn't do it for me. Don't really care whether we make like this amount of profit or we two exit next year. Like That's not it for me. I'm really into impact. That's what drives my career. So when I think about the goals I want to set for Whole30 or what I want to do with this Boundaries book, it's not I want to sell X copies or I want to make this much money. It's I want, you know, I want people to come back and tell me that this book changed their life, you know? And so I think different people are motivated by different things. Keeping that big picture in mind is incredibly important. This is where like having mentors who are older and wiser and have seen more and done more than you can come in really handy. I've had a few mentors in my life who have made a lot of impact, who have said things like, yeah, I get that you're working 80 hours a week so that you can have an awesome life when you're retired. What does your life look like now? How's that working out for you for like the next 20 years while you hustle this hard? And it was like, dang, you know? <laughs> okay. So I think those relationships can be really helpful too. Having people who are just like straight shooters, been there, done that, offer you a perspective that you're maybe too involved in, in your own life to see for yourself. For somebody who is at that point in the journey where they're ready to take on a mentor or somebody that could help coach them. Because there are so many people with these different titles now with the internet and you can Google and it's just overwhelming, how would you recommend somebody find a good one? That's It's really hard because my mentors have all happened relatively organically. One of them happened to be a boss for a short period of time at my old job. One of them happened to be my professor in my organizational behavior class. Another one was a recommendation from my sister who said, like this person isn't, you know, Dave is like not in your industry. He doesn't do what you do. He doesn't even know what you do, but I think you should talk to him. And he was just so smart in terms of helping me guide my business and entrepreneur journey. You know, I think subscribing to newsletters, following people on Instagram who motivate and inspire you, it never hurts to ask. Hey, I'm looking for, and be specific in your ask and don't ask for too much. I'm looking for someone where, once a month, I might shoot you a quick question about my career or my progression. And maybe, you know, would you have time to spend 10 minutes thinking about a response? And you can email me, you can send me a voice memo, you can call me on the phone. Is that something you would be open to? You might be surprised how many people are like, yeah, I would do that if you just ask. So don't be afraid to ask and look and then seek inspiration from people where you look at their life and go, yeah, that's, that's what I want. I want to do that. And they don't have to be in your industry and they don't have to do what you do to offer you really helpful, insightful perspective. Earlier, you touched on your previous history with drugs and you touched on the fact that a lot of times for change, people need to hit these, these roadblocks in life, unfortunately, or fortunately, to you know be the catalyst to move them forward. Yeah. Let's go back and get into some of the details of that part of your life where 
you use that that time, that very trying time, and things could have really went either way. And and again, if somebody's in a similar situation, whether it's drugs or other tight positions in life where people are feeling crushed right now, I think hearing your story and how you were able to pivot the right way could be really helpful for people. I mean, when you say things could have gone either way, things did go both ways, right? The first time I entered into recovery, it was because my live-in boyfriend at the time gave me, had tried to set boundaries with me that I completely ran over and finally gave me an ultimatum. Like, I'm going to call this rehab facility and check you in because you need help and I cannot continue to help you. And if you can't do this, I need to leave for my own safety and health. And I went and I was in recovery, tentatively just hanging on by my fingernails for a year. And then I relapsed. And I relapsed. And what they don't tell you about relapses is that you dive back into using just as hard and aggressively, and it gets just as bad very, very quickly. And I really thought that this time I was going to die. And so when I self-arrested and checked myself back into rehab that second time, I knew things needed to be different, and I didn't know how to make them different. And it wasn't until in a moment of like such stress and duress where I found myself in a situation where my recovery was so at risk that an honest to God boundary like vomited out of my mouth onto my friend. And the way he received it and the way he just, I said, I cannot be here. This is not a safe environment for me. We need to go home. And he was like, okay. And after asking me a few questions, he took me home. And I thought, could it be that? Could it be this simple? I thought boundaries were the thing that were going to shrink my life and push people away and make my life so much smaller. And in that moment, my life expanded beyond what I ever could have imagined. And that was the first glimpse I had at what my life could be like. And I recognized that continuing to set boundaries with other people and myself around my recovery and my health were the key that was an incredibly powerful and transformative experience. So all of that to say, it did go one way and it didn't go well. And it wasn't until I accidentally stumbled upon what would become a few gifts in my recovery boundaries, a growth mindset, and going back to therapy and sort of unpacking my trauma and rediscovering my worth and value that things really turned around. And coming back to that example with your friend where you set that first boundary where it was actually life and death, what do you think it was about that time that allowed you to do that? Was it just the fact that you'd been through so much stuff and 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 you were feeling crushed to that point? Or was there something different about that experience that day that allowed you to do that? It was it was pure terror. Pure terror. The first time I relapsed, I w- found myself... I had no plans of using again, and I found myself in a at a party with some people I didn't know. And before I knew it, I'm in the bathroom with something dripping down the back of my throat, and I don't know what it was, and I don't know why I did it. Like it happened so fast, and I was terrified that it would happen again. I was at a party with people I didn't know, and people didn't know I had relapsed, and like there was nothing keeping me from that same situation happening and and I didn't think I would make it back again. It was sheer terror. I wish I could say I had this dramatic realization and, but no, I was terrified for my own life and blurted out the only thing I could think of that might save my butt. And it turned out it was a boundary and it turned out the person I shared it with respected it. And even the act of saying it made me realize that if he had laughed at me and said, like, you're being dramatic, forget it, I would have left myself. This was way before the days of Uber. I would have figured out a ride home and like gotten myself out of that situation. So I'm hoping that when people read my book, they don't have to have this like dramatic, terrible life and death situation or crisis to recognize that there are ways to advocate for yourself and stand up for yourself and that you're worthy of doing so. And here are the words that you need to come out of your mouth to make this experience like better for you. And since given the story where you were in recovery and you had that slip up and then you started to recovery again, this, this second time, what we're talking about here, yeah. how long down the recovery journey was it before you realized I really have a hold on this and, and I'm, you know, I don't know if you ever feel like you're totally free of it, but till you felt like you had control. 
So I don't know that there was like any one moment that I felt like I was recovered. It's definitely a sliding scale. But what I continued to do was build more and more buffers between me and my drug use. So, you know, I I made a new friend group. I started going to the gym. I started eating healthier. I went back to therapy. I got rid of clothes and music that reminded me of my drug use so that at some point I noticed if and when someone asked me, like, hey, do you want a puff of like a joint? And they did at some point, you know, I, I found myself in a situation. It was easy to be like, nope, I'm good. Or to say like, no, I don't use or no, I'm in recovery. And though I never take that for granted, I still am very actively conscientious about my recovery status and making sure that, you know, I'm protected against any of those old things. I can equivocally say now, 22 years into my recovery, that there is not a situation that could happen or like any situation I could put myself in where picking up would be an option. So I still say I'm a recovered addict because I feel like that serves my recovery. But at this point, I'm just a, I'm a totally new person. Well, I'm so happy for you. Yeah, thanks. And you touched on something there, getting a new group of friends. And this ties back to something we talked about before, where I said with certain boundaries, there's these other layers, whether it be that you're in the workforce or with family. Those two examples where we can't just pick up and and leave those things. And then there's other boundaries we can set with, well, actually beyond a boundary with friends where we can decide, you know, this just isn't working and I can step away. Yeah. You know, the boundary itself is the consequence. It is the action that you are willing to take to keep yourself safe and healthy and to pr- and potentially to preserve the relationship if they are not willing to re- respect the limits that you have set. So <clears throat> the boundary is not the request, the would you please go outside with that cigarette. That is simply an expression of a limit that you may or may not have previously expressed that they may or may not know about. The boundary itself is the action that you are willing to take. And <clears throat> one of the things I ask people when they think about the boundary that they want to set is, are you willing to take this final action to hold this boundary? You know, if you say to your mom, if you talk about my body or wait one more time after after I've asked you not to, I'm not, I'm going to take a break from communications with you. Are you willing and prepared to hold that limit? And I want to emphasize that it's not this like all or nothing. It's not like I'm either cutting the relationship off or you're going to respect my boundary. You just may have to think about how are the ways that I can continue this relationship and still keep myself safe and healthy. So maybe it's we don't talk on the phone anymore because when we're on the phone, I can't control when you choose to spring this conversation topic on me. We're only going to communicate via email for a little while. And if your email contains information that I've asked you not to share with me or ask me about, I'm going to delete it and not reply. So it's not this all or nothing. There may be areas kind of of in between where you can still preserve the relationship, but set the boundary that you need. But it does require a lot of introspection and it does require you to ask yourself some pretty hard questions. And when it comes to holding the boundary, like you're just talking about, I'd imagine it's really important to really think about this when you can. Sometimes it's going to come up in conversation and you may just set set a boundary that you haven't pre-thought of and and really mulled over. But when you can, you want to make sure it is a boundary that you can hold up because otherwise it's going to be wishy-washy. It's going to cause confusion in the relationship. And then down the line, if you're really wanting to set a real boundary and stick to it, that person's just not going to take you seriously. Yes. One of the first rules of parenting that I learned was never to impose a consequence that you could not or weren't willing to enforce. Right. So this whole like the example I use in the book is when I tell my kid, like if you, you know, hey, if you can't follow through with this, like no iPad for a week. And he just looks at me like, okay, mom, because he knows that that hurts me just as much as it hurts him. And so that's not a, a consequence that we set. The same thing goes with boundaries. You really have to think all the way through to What happens if this person doesn't respect my green boundary? How am I going to escalate to a yellow? How will I escalate to a red? What are the consequences that I'm willing to impose? Am I able to hold those consequences? That's a really good question to ask yourself to make sure that your boundary really is from the self and not about controlling someone else. Because if the end result is, well, ultimately, there really isn't anything I can do, then it's not 
actually an effective boundary, right? The boundary always has to be centered on the actions you can and will take. So yeah, there is definitely a lot of introspection. And and as hard as it is to hold the boundary, that's like an equally important part of the puzzle to setting it. Because if you set it and then back down, you have established that precedence. You have told yourself that you're not actually worthy of holding this limit. And you've sent a really powerful message to your body. And so for all of those reasons, the holding can be the hard part, but it's also the most important part. Yeah. And there's different layers as you're talking about this. The fact that if it involves somebody else, you're being wishy-washy with them, but mm-hmm. you're also being wishy-washy with yourself. Yes. And you're not building that confidence in in the dialogue that you use with other people. Yes. And then we can use that in a solo way too, where if you say you're going to be somewhere on time, it doesn't involve somebody else, but that's a boundary that you're trying to hold being on time to things and you don't follow through, you're going to, you're going to, you know, chip away at your confidence and and your well being. Yeah. That's such an important point. And I think one that is often overlooked, it's, it is the message that we are sending to others, but it's, equally important the message that we're sending to ourselves. When we fail to hold a boundary, we do chip away at our confidence. We do send the message that our needs maybe aren't valid or that we can't trust ourselves to know what we need or that we aren't worthy of holding those limits. And there are absolutely very specific challenges that come with holding a self-boundary where you're the only one who knows if you hold it or not. And you're the only one who has to address the consequences if you hold it or not. And what are the consequences? Because like, if you just show up late and you know you don't get fired because of it or defriended because of it, but like you're just late to this thing that you said you wouldn't be late to, what actually really happens? And this is where I provide a lot of introspective prompts in the book, especially around self-boundaries, which is really thinking about the impact of not holding that boundary with yourself, the consequences that it will have in all of the areas that you just shared. And if you do hold the boundary, the potential freedoms that you will achieve, that future you will get to enjoy as a result of holding. So yes, the messages we send to ourselves with our boundaries are just as important as what they convey to others. Really important stuff. Yeah. Let's talk more about the kid piece. I'm a parent, you're a parent, you mentioned your son and the iPad. Let's talk about as a parent who even tuning into this is now aware of boundaries. They start setting boundaries in their own life, but they have young kids and they want to, in a healthy way, expose them to boundaries, guide them when it comes to boundaries. And when they're young enough, I'm assuming you you can elaborate on this, set boundaries for them when they're not at that point when they can set their own. Yes. My son has always grown up with the concept of healthy boundaries being modeled for him. So he, when he was young, I was very young, you know, toddler, I was able to set boundaries with him around certain things. So if he wanted me to pick him up, it was, Hey buddy, I've got these groceries in my arms right now. When I go to the counter and put them down, then I'll pick you up. If he wanted me when I was on a phone call, it was, you know, Hey, I'm talking to Nana T. I need you to be patient. Like I, I see you and I'd pat his hand And during a natural break in the conversation, pretty early on, I would ask Nana T to hold on and I would ask my son what he needed and I would just extend those periods of asking him to be patient. I could also set boundaries on his behalf. So one of the big ones I set with him early and taught him early was, you don't have to hug or kiss anyone if you don't want to, right? I taught him the subject of consent very early. So even though when Nana came to visit, she really wanted a hug goodbye, I always said to him, how do you want to say goodbye to Nana T? Do you want to hug? Do you want to kiss? Do you want to high five? Do you want to fist bump? Do you just want to wave and say goodbye? Those are all perfectly polite options, but if he didn't feel like a hug, I wasn't going to make him. So I advocated for him. I taught him healthy boundaries. He got to witness me setting healthy boundaries with him. And the older he got, the more expansive those boundaries could become. So it turned into like, hey, I, I can't make you breakfast yet. I have 10 more minutes in my garage gym workout. Um, I will be in when I can. You can either start breakfast yourself or you can read a book until I'm done. Or I have to work until 4 p.m. today, so I need you to sit quietly. And as soon as I'm done, then we can play. And now we're starting to watch him at nine feel really comfortable setting boundaries with us. You know, um, this is my journal. I don't want you to read it. Okay, cool. Uh, Please don't come into my room without knocking. Absolutely. You got it. I don't want you to pick out my clothes anymore. Okay. All right. You know, as long as it's appropriate and meets the school dress code, like go for it. And so 
Now we've modeled this example, and hopefully he will grow up understanding that boundaries are healthy, they're not selfish, they're not cold, and feel comfortable setting them with us and other people in his life too. What would you say to somebody on the other end of the spectrum? Say they're 75, they're, you know, getting older in life, and they haven't had good boundaries throughout their life. So they're hearing this right now, and they're feeling like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm old. Is there any point in taking this on at this point? A, and then B, how would you help them grieve the fact that, because it would be, you know, disappointing in a way to get to that point in your life and realize that you haven't had good boundaries and maybe people have walked all over you in different ways throughout your life. So when you're at the other end of the spectrum, what do you say to those people? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I say the same thing about boundaries as I would say about doing the Whole30 or changing the way that you eat. It is never too late. It's never too late to implement the things that you now know could be helpful in making your life happier and healthier and applying them. Absolutely dive in, right? Absolutely. And also, you know, there's no point in looking back and being mad at yourself for the things that you just didn't know or just couldn't do. You could not have done this then. And I know that because you didn't. You didn't have the knowledge. You didn't have the confidence. You hadn't done the work. You didn't have the information or the scripts or the permission or whatever it looks like. You couldn't have. And it's okay to grieve for some of the things, right? Maybe the relationships lost or the resentments that you held because you didn't have or enforce healthy boundaries, but certainly don't beat yourself up for it. Certainly don't carry that regret around forever. Turn that around into, you know, I didn't know then what I know now. I know better now. I can start this practice now and let me look ahead to what my life can look like when I start taking action based on the knowledge that I have in this moment. And I I absolutely encourage everyone to do that. That feels like a very compassionate and graceful way to approach, you know, learning new information and recognizing that when you know better, you can start to do better. For somebody who's tuned into this point, setting boundaries, at least in a way that's very structured, is new to them. And they're ready, you know, after our call here to jump into their life and assess and set some healthy boundaries and get going to help them out because this is new. What are some of the biggest boundary mistakes you see people making? Hmm. I think one of the biggest mistakes is... Again, accepting the rhetoric handed down to us from the patriarchy and sexism and stereotypical rigid gender roles that boundaries are mean or controlling or selfish. We have to very actively unlearn that. All of us do, but particularly women, particularly moms, we all have to unlearn the idea that like our needs don't matter. We should keep ourselves small. We should always prioritize others' comfort or needs ahead of our own. We got to unlearn that every single day. And don't beat yourself up if you fall back into sort of old habits or old thinking patterns. It's just a like, oh, I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. Let me act from this point going forward. I also think we've become accustomed to passive, aggressive comments, eye rolls, hints, or jokes. And we think of those as setting boundaries, but like they're not clear and they're not particularly kind. So in order to set the boundary, you have to actually set the boundary using clear, kind language. It is direct language. And I keep saying clear and kind. It's a framework that Brene Brown um, shared in her book, Dare to Lead, that she so graciously allowed me to include in the book, but it fits boundaries so perfectly. So you've got to use your words and express what your limits are clearly or kindly. You can't hint or expect people to mind read. And then third, just remember that boundaries are a practice. You won't always get it right on the first try. You might say yes reluctantly and then go back and say, on second thought, I just said yes, but I really do need to think about my capacity and whether I can take this on. Give me another day to let you know. It's okay if you don't get it right the first time. It's okay if you have to explain like, hey, I've let this slide for the last 10 years and I've been resentful about it. And that isn't helpful for me or for our relationship. So now I'm going to set a limit and here is that limit. And I invite you to respect that for the good of our relationship. It's okay to need practice because this is a practice. um, And I just encourage you to continue to practice. The easier, you know, the more you do, the easier it gets. 
If you're somebody who's noticing somebody in your life, whether it be a romantic partner, a brother or sister, a parent, somebody you're really close to is being walked all over and they don't have good boundaries in their life, do you feel it's ever something we should do as somebody who's cognizant of this to step in, introduce them to boundaries, and maybe give them some suggestions? Maybe. Tread carefully here because if they have not asked you for help or asked you for your opinion, offering unsolicited opinions is not necessarily the best way to make friends and influence people. They may not be ready to hear what you are. They may actually not see a need for a boundary at all. One person's that is not okay with me as another person's like, yep, no problem. Go ahead. So, you know, be careful about not imposing your boundary expectations on other people. What I like to encourage people to do is just to lead by quiet example. Very often I hear people say, I didn't know I could do this until I saw you do it. And then I was like, huh, if she can do it, if she can say no, if she can say no, thank you, if she can say I'm not drinking right now, if she can say I'm not going to answer that, maybe I can too. And I think that can be a very powerful example, allowing this person to watch you set and hold healthy boundaries and do it in a way that is graceful and compassionate and calm and grounded can be really motivating. And of course, if they do ask you for help or advice, then of course, share everything you've learned, be a boundary ally for them, where if they're trying to set a boundary and being overrun, you can offer your support or your language or whatever is needed in that moment to help them. Like absolutely at that moment you can, but I'm not a big fan of offering unsolicited opinions. I agree. That makes sense. Yeah. You got to be careful. Let's end our conversation talking about romantic relationships. This is an area we definitely need to be aware of boundaries, set good boundaries, and and this is the relationship we're likely going to have the most contact with day in, day out, where the boundaries are going to have the most powerful impact. Yeah. And I want to start talking about your golden rule, where as somebody in the relationship, you want to say what you mean and trust that your partner is doing the same. Yes. Why is that so important? My relationship golden rule, and listen, this is not just for romantic partnerships. Every single relationship in your life would be better if you said what you meant and trusted other people to do the same. All too often, you see this dynamic in romantic partnerships where it's like, hey, babe, I'm going to go out tonight. Is that okay? And like inside, you're seething, right? You're just Like, no, it's not okay. Can't you see how much we have to do? Or I really wanted you home for dinner. This is the third night in a row and you just eat it and you go, yeah, I guess that's okay. And they choose to like not hear your tone and they go, thanks. And they're already out the door. And then you spend the next three hours seething and then they come home and they're like, hey, how was your night? And you're like, great. And then you explode in rage. Like all of that could be avoided if you say what you mean and you expect your partner to do the same it changes the entire dynamic. So when you say to me, can I go out? And I think about it and I either say, yep, I'm cool with it. Now you know, yeah, she's actually legitimately cool with it and I'm not gonna walk into like an you know absolute chaos. Or if I say, no, I really need you to stay home tonight. You're like, okay, this is a need of hers. Let's talk about why it is. Is there a compromise we can have? Is there something I can do to make her? Or maybe I do just need to stay home and like we'll talk about it. Every relationship in your life is better if you operate in that fashion. And I don't think it's common for a number of reasons. And I think that even sometimes people think it's rude somehow to just say what you think. Can I go out tonight? You know what? I'd rather you not. That's not rude. It's direct. And then you can have a conversation and like everything is easier. So yes, I it's my golden rule for a reason. And it seems like it'd be really important, especially with a romantic partner, when you're taking this on to have a discussion beforehand and explain to them, like you just explained, the benefits and and that this is going to be a new thing. Because if you've been living together for 20 years and not behaving in this manner, they're going to be thrown off and it could cause conflict uh, otherwise could be avoided. It could. You know, <clears throat> I think... You certainly, this is one example where you're in a romantic partnership. You want to be incredibly generous. You want to maintain connection. So if my husband says, can I go out tonight? And I say, no, that's an, it's an acceptable response, but here's where I would absolutely volunteer more information, right? Like he, I would really rather you not. And here's why I've got this X, Y, Z going on. I'm really just feeling like super down and lonely. And I could use an hour of cuddle time, like whatever that looks like, I'm going to volunteer more information. But the benefit of this 
is that when I am comfortable saying no and really tapping into my feelings and my needs, not only am I rebuilding trust with myself and reminding myself that my needs are valid and worthy, when I say yes, you know I mean it. When people say to me, hey, can you show up for this work thing? Hey, will you work on this project with me? Hey, can I get a quote for you, you know, from you for this? And I think about it and say, yes, they know they can count on me because I would not say yes just to be nice. I'm not that nice. So I think the benefits really outweigh any potential uncomfortableness in this situation with a romantic partnership. If you explain why, what you're doing and why you're doing it, you model good behavior. And then when you have challenges, you are graceful, but also very grounded in your approach. So my husband stomping around the house you know, making all of these kind of signs that he's mad at me until he tells me that he is mad at me, we do not have a problem. I do not know there is a problem. I am not going to pick that up. I'm not going to try to tease it out of you. And that sometimes makes him mad or frustrated. But I'm like, look, if we need to talk about something, let's talk about it. And otherwise, I'm just going to leave that with you. And it's not always easy or comfortable, but it does make things 10 times easier on the back end. When it comes to romantic relationships, what are some of the areas somebody tuning in can assess right now when it comes to boundaries, some of the biggest ones that they want to make sure they investigate and make sure healthy boundaries are set there? Yeah, it's challenging in romantic relationships because a lot of the places where people want to set boundaries, it's not really like a boundary conversation. So division of household labor is a great example. That is one of the most common complaints in heterosexual relationships from women is that they have the bulk of the household labor, the invisible man, the invisible labor and the household management, and their partner doesn't do enough. And the complaint of the partner, the man in this heterosexual relationship says, my wife is constantly nagging me to do more and that's hurting our relationship. It's really hard to set a boundary that's going to fix that situation because if my boundary is, I'm not doing any more dishes and then it comes time for family dinner night and there are no dishes. That hurts me as much as it hurts the rest of the family. So in some areas in the book, I offer other books or tips or tricks or strategies and some boundary examples that can help. But one really common area of boundaries that you can work on in your romantic relationship is around physical connection. So if there are certain physical acts that you're just not comfortable with, don't want to do, if there's a specific time of the day where your partner is making advances and it just doesn't work for you for one reason or another, if you don't want to be touched in a certain area, or those are all really powerful situations in which you can set a boundary, you can hold a boundary, and you can deepen your connection and trust and relationship with really just a few simple words of communication. It seems like a lot of what we're talking about today comes down to authenticity and communication. Being authentic with yourself, really realizing what it is you need for yourself and what you need for yourself within other relationships, and then communicating that and making sure that there's honesty, truthfulness, and open-hearted communication. Yes, absolutely. And I think the part we almost need to like back up one step further, which is before you can have that authenticity with yourself, you have to create the space for yourself to ask, what do I need? What is my body telling me? What is my brain telling me? What is my heart telling me? What is my spirit telling me? Is this, can I identify this need? Can I identify the limit that I could set to make me feel better? Do I need to do some work to remind myself that I'm worthy of having this need be respected and that my needs matter and that my happiness and mental health and energetic capacity matter. It's like there's pre-work that needs to be done just you with you before you can even show up to the conversation around boundaries to recognize my need is valid. I am worthy of having it met. This is the limit that I need to set. Now I can communicate it with other people. So yeah, it's like a multi-step process that very often has to go all the way back to the beginning to acknowledge that I even have needs and I can be trusted to know my own needs. As you're sharing that, it seems like a lot of that comes back to self-confidence. Yes. I mean, it is self-confidence. Some of it, though, is really unlearning, again, the influences that society, and I'm speaking largely again for women, 
that the patriarchy have sort of imparted upon us. Like we have, our self-confidence has been stripped away from us with the constant messages that we should be small and silent and compliant and our needs don't matter and other people's you know, needs and wants are always more important than our own, especially when we become mothers. So I think there are so many messages we get from the media, from diet culture, from the patriarchy that like, we can't trust ourselves. We don't know ourselves. We need someone else to help us figure out like what we need and what we want, because those things that that come from us are not trustworthy and aren't worthy. All of that needs to be stripped away before we can even settle into any semblance of self-confidence. And so Yes, that is absolutely a piece of it. And setting this boundary, having it be respected and realizing all of the freedoms that this boundary builds is a key way of continuing to build that self-confidence. But the unlearning part has to come first. And Melissa, as you express talking about boundaries with your audience, do you find that it's mostly women that are being affected by this, not having good boundaries and not setting them? I do think that this is largely, of course, everyone would benefit from clear, kind communication, setting and holding good boundaries, identifying your needs. But yes, I think women in particular have been conditioned to see boundaries as selfish and cold and mean and walls and off-putting to, again, for all of the reasons I just listed, like not have needs. Or when we think we have needs, been told we can't really trust our own needs or our own wants or our own desires. So yeah, I definitely am speaking largely to women in part because that's the bulk of my following and in part because I'm deeply invested in the way that I grew up and the messages that I learned and all of the unlearning that I've now done and the fact that I feel like I am giving permission to an enormous, you know, millions of people now to say, no, no, that's not how that's not how it is and that's not how I'm going to choose to think about it going forward and I'm going to start showing up for myself differently. Do you think there's any evolutionary advantage to feeling discomfort when it comes to boundaries? Because this does seem like, again, you're talking about women, this being a pocket that tends to have more trouble in this area, but it is a widespread problem that a lot of us deal with. So I'm curious, like, is there any advantage why we've evolved to have discomfort when it comes to setting boundaries or being open about our needs? Is it does it come back to that whole tribalism thing and not wanting to be shunned out of the group and just trying to fit in, do you think? I think it's an echo of a formerly helpful evolutionary response to doing something harmful to someone else and that makes you feel uncomfortable and guilty. That earned guilt, that earned discomfort biologically is incredibly helpful because when we harm someone else, we should feel bad. That does affect the group as a whole. That does affect our relationships. And that guilt can help us remember, ooh, that didn't feel good. It hurt the other person. I don't want to do it again. What we have now when it comes to setting a truly healthy boundary from the self is unearned discomfort, unearned guilt, We feel like we're doing something wrong and hurting someone else, but we're not. It's not deserved. It's not earned. So no, I don't think in this context it is helpful. I think what it is is an echo of another situation or circumstance in which we have done wrong being forced upon us into what actually is like a very healthy practice. We feel like we're doing something wrong when we set a healthy boundary because that are that those are the messages that have been imparted upon us, but we're not. And that feeling of guilt or that feeling of feeling bad after the fact is not actually helpful. The discomfort, that comes with like any challenging situation, any negative emotion. And sure, I think, you know, learning to sit in discomfort is incredibly helpful, recognizing that like, yes, it's uncomfortable, but I can sit with it and move through it. But some of the other feelings like the guilt or the shame or the feeling bad, not earned, and I don't think helpful in this context. So other than some of the negative feelings that might come up or losing arguably people that aren't to your benefit having them in your life, by setting good boundaries, are there any downsides that we need to be aware of? I mean, are there downsides to setting healthy boundaries and having your needs be respected? I mean, you might have your social group might be too amazing. 
and you have too many people wanting to be in touch with you and talk about your feelings. Your, your romantic relationship could be so incredibly fulfilling. Like I can't think of downsides, you know? There certainly is perhaps grief associated with having to let certain relationships go because you recognize that those people are simply incapable or unwilling to respect your reasonable healthy limit. There's grief involved, but there's also an enormous amount of freedom that comes with that as well, with not having to dread every interaction, with not feeling like you're constantly being run over, which with with freeing up that energetic capacity to meet new people who will respect those limits and who will engage with you in a way that makes you feel better, you know, about yourself and about your relationship. So I'm not saying it's all like, you know, roses and rainbows throughout the process, but if you do establish a healthy boundary practice in that communication and you get better at both setting and receiving other people's boundaries, there's only freedom and improved relationships and better mental health and less anxiety and you know less stress and discomfort to be had from that practice. Melissa, thank you for the conversation. Love this. Love the book. This is going to help a lot of people. A very important subject that isn't talked about enough. So thank you for doing the work you do. We're going to link the book up in the show notes. We're going to link up your social media, your website, everything. And again, thank you for all you do. Thank you, Jesse. I always love chatting with you. Now that you're finished with Melissa, stick around here and catch my chat with Nedra, where you're going to learn even more about boundaries. I'll see you over there. The beginning of setting boundaries is figuring out what the solution is, what you want or need. If you're not familiar with setting boundaries and...